Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Ritman Grace Podcast. Our church's vision is to have a passion for God and compassion for people. We hope that the teachings in this podcast will encourage you as you seek to follow Christ and grow in your faith. Now, let's get into today's message. Well, hello again and good morning. My name is Clark. I'm the pastor here. If we have never met, I would love to meet you. Love to meet your family after service today. Well, what a moment. Amazing to see uh, Ethan's last day today and uh, glad that uh, Ashley could be here too. Uh, if I didn't mention this, I wanted to say, uh, if you want more information about the ministry that Ashley's involved in, you can connect with her out in the lobby afterwards. So just want to encourage you to do that. Well, we are in a sermon series called DNA, where we are looking at our eight core biblical values as a church, uh, values that we want to be defined by. Uh, we said this at the beginning of this sermon series, we want to be known for these eight biblical core values, and we're not creating these. We're not just making these up. These are all from Scripture. This is what God desires His church and His bride to be known for. And so far, just to recap a little bit, because we're actually entering into week seven of a eight-week-long series, uh, so far in week one, we talked all about the Bible and how we want to pattern our lives after God's Word. We want to submit to that. Week two, we talked about prayer and the importance of it. Uh, week three, we looked at worship. Week four, we looked at what it means to be a missional church. Uh, week five, we talked about the value of biblical community. Uh, the week after that, we talked about uh, equipping. It, last week, if you were here, you might remember we said that it's not the few who do the ministry for the many, but it's a few who equip the many for the ministry. We're all called the full-time ministry. Today, we're going to be looking at our next value, which is coming generations. Coming generations. And here's what we have to say about this value of coming generations. We will leverage our influences on coming generations, helping them see life from God's point of view. So it's not very long, but there's a lot to unpack there. So I want to take some time this morning to talk about our responsibility. What is our responsibility towards our children? What is our responsibility toward our kids here at Ritman Grace Brethren Church? And what is our responsibility as Christ followers towards the next generation? So that's a question I want to pursue in our time remaining uh, this morning. I think it's really fascinating, though. Uh, th th that question is a fascinating one, because I think if you ask our culture that question right now, what is our responsibility towards the next generation? I think that they would often say, by and large, don't get in their way. Just don't get in their way. That's what our culture, I believe, would tell us, that we need to free our kids to be who they truly are. And you often find the culture advocating us to teach our kids how to listen to their hearts. You hear that a lot. Listen to their hearts, to follow their dreams, to pursue whatever they desire. Our culture says that we need to remove the restraints of the fear of judgment so that they can be free to express who they truly are. So the culture puts a great amount of time and energy helping kids to believe in their sel themselves, to follow their hearts, to chase their desires. But is that what is really needed? Is that what's really needed? Should that be our approach to the next generation? Is that our responsibility towards our kids, to help them to be free to follow their desires? I think that might sound good to some people, but I'm here to tell you this morning that there is a fatal flaw in that approach. And there's a fatal flaw in the approach of our culture, and that fatal flaw is an anthropological one. And here's what I mean by that. Our fatal flaw in our culture's approach to children comes from bad anthropology. That's a $10 word. Anthropology, what is that? It's the study of man. The fatal flaw in our culture's approach to children comes from a misunderstanding of human nature, a misunderstanding of the nature of man. Our culture seems to view children as these blank slates, uh, those with good hearts that just need to need the right environment so that those hearts can be free to express themselves. But here's the thing. That's not what the Bible teaches about our nature. That's not what the Bible says, what God says about the reality of the human heart. If you have your Bibles, you could turn with me to the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, chapter 17. We're going to be doing a little bit of jumping around this morning, so you can feel free to follow around on the screen along on the screen, but 
We're going to jump around a couple different places as we answer this question, what is our responsibility towards the next generation as followers of Jesus? And the first place we're going to be is Jeremiah. After God calls his people to trust in him, to not trust in their hearts, but to trust in him, God then tells them why in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, which says this, The heart is, what's the word? Say it with me deceitful above all things and beyond cure who can understand it well, i'm just going to trust my heart really because that's god's word on the condition of our hearts and i want to be clear about something when the bible speaks of our hearts when the bible talks about our hearts it's not just talking about the center of our emotions that's like the way a hallmark card talks about the heart Jeremiah 17, verse 9, is talking about the center of our nature. When the Bible speaks about the heart, it's talking about the center of our being, the seat of our intellect, the seat of our will, the seat of our emotions and our affections. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says this, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Some of your translations say, the heart is the wellspring of life. What an image. The heart is the center of our being, where all of our thoughts, all of our feelings, and all of our actions flow. It's the fount of our nature. But Jeremiah tells us that our hearts are deceitful and beyond cure. In other words, the wellspring has been polluted. It's contaminated. And what flows from the fount cannot be trusted. And that's why whenever I hear somebody say, just follow your heart. Listen to your heart. I just want to say, are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? Don't you understand the heart? The heart is deceitful above all things. Do you really want to be drinking from that fountain? Do you really want to be resting in that wisdom? Instead of listening to our hearts, we need to be suspicious of our hearts. Speaking the truth to our hearts. I followed my heart in my early 20s and it didn't go well. Because our hearts need to be confronted with the truth. And here's my point in bringing all of that up. This isn't just true as adults. You don't just turn 21 and this happens to your heart. This isn't just true for adults. This is also true for children. Look at Proverbs 22.15. It gives us a picture of the heart of a child. It says this, folly is bound up in the heart of a child. Folly, not goodness, but folly. The Bible says that that's what's bound up. In the heart of a child, that's what's flowing from their spring. But what does the Bible mean by that word folly? Does it just mean that they're kind of silly? Unfortunately, that's not what the Bible means. The word folly is closely related to the term fool. When those words are used, especially in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, just think about Psalms or Proverbs, the Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, and Job. When the terms folly or fool are used, in those wisdom books, do you know what they speak of? They speak of rebelliousness. Rebellion against God. Look at Psalm 14. I want to give you a picture of this usage of this idea of folly or fool speaking rebellion against God. It says this in Psalm 14, The fool says in his heart, what? There is no God. I want to be clear about this text this morning. What's being described is not this kind of ignorant atheism that somehow fails to see God. What's being described here is this, by the psalmist is a boasting and sin as though there is no God. It's boasting as though I'm never going to be accountable for my actions. That's the idea. But, but that's his foolishness, right? This foolishness is not simply an ignorance, but it's a rebellion, an embrace in the face of God. And to be clear, that rebellion is not an ignorance that's on the mind of the psalmist. Just look at the next line of what he says. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. Notice what the psalmist says next in verse 2. The Lord looks down from heaven and on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. And what did he find? Verse 3 tells us, All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. See what the psalmist is describing here is the natural heart of man. It is the heart that is full of rebellious folly. 
And that's the folly that is bound up in the heart of a child, the Bible says. What the Bible teaches is that we are, we come into this world with this godless folly bound up into our hearts. And left to our own devices, we will do what? We'll run. We will run away from God and His good ways. We will spend our entire lives running from the author of life. And we're going to run towards that which is corrupt. We'll follow our hearts, and guess where that's going to lead us? Into all kinds of trouble. It'll lead us into idolatry. It'll lead us into vanity. It'll lead us into godlessness, because our hearts are fountains of folly from which the streams of our rebelliousness flow. That's biblical anthropology. 101. That's biblical anthropology. Aren't you glad that you came to church this morning? What wonderful news. But it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. Our hearts are fountains of folly from which the streams of our rebelliousness flow. But here's the deal. Here's why all that was worth mentioning to you today. If we embrace our culture's approach to raising children, just encouraging them to follow their own hearts, what are we doing to them? We are sending our children to their own destruction. That's what we're doing. We're telling them, go drink from that polluted fountain. We're telling them, listen to that which is deceitful above all things. Oh, that'll do you a lot of good. We're telling them to pursue desires which are driven by that which is corrupt and desperately sick. We're telling them to run with that part of you that is going to lead you away from God. Why would we do that to our kids? Isn't living in this world tough enough? Why would we do that? Well, the Bible invites us to a different approach to raising our kids. The Bible, operating from a correct anthropology, calls us to disciple our children, to teach them, to train them, to confront their hearts with truth. And if you that were paying attention this morning might realize that when we looked at Proverbs 22 earlier, we didn't look at the full verse. It continues, and it goes on to say, not only is folly bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. Listen, the Bible's not saying that we just beat the godlessness out of our kids. That's not what it's saying. Sorry to disappoint you. The Bible is talking about the corrective discipline in the lives of our children, to be confronted with the truth. Proverbs makes this point over and over again. We see it in Proverbs chapter 3. Solomon says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. And notice when you bounce down to verse 5, a lot of people know this verse, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, shun evil. This will bring health to your body, nourishment to your bones. You see, Solomon is confronting the heart of his son with corrective truth. And that's what our children need. The call is not to get out of their way and let them be free to follow their own desires. We are called to disciple our children in truth. We are to teach. We are to train. We are to disciple our children in truth. That's our responsibility towards the next generation. God has called His people to disciple up the next generation in His truth. And a powerful expression of this is found in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me this morning to Deuteronomy chapter 6. That's where we're going to be camping out mainly this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and if you don't have a Bible, we'll have the words up on the screen for you. As you're turning there in your Bibles, let me explain how we'd like to structure the rest of our time together. I want to press deeper into what it means uh, to what we're called to as followers of Christ by further unpacking our responsibility towards our kids. I want to really flesh this out. We're always talking about making disciples of the next generation. We need to spiritually invest in the next generation. We need to make disciples of the next generation. What exactly does that look like, practically speaking? Before we launch into all that, let me just take a moment to set the scene for you here in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, here at this point in the history of God's people, the Israelites have been delivered from their slavery, their bondage to the Egyptians. And through the plagues and the leadership of Moses and Aaron, God brought his people out of Egypt, and now they are headed into the promised land.
But as they're on their way to the promised land, the Bible says that they grumbled and that they complained against God. They complained against Moses. As they come to the edge of the promised land, on the verge, what happens? They send out 12 spies. And 10 of the spies give a bad report. Two of the spies said, no, we can do it. Who do the people listen to? They listen to the 10. So in that moment, picture this, as they're on the verge of entering the promised land, the people turn against God. They turn against Moses who led them. And in their faithlessness, they doubt that God can do what God has promised to do. So God judged that faithless generation, the Bible says, and sent them into the wilderness for 40 years until that generation dies off, and then their kids are raised up. So the book of Deuteronomy is really God's word to that next generation. This new generation is now receiving the law of God. The book of Deuteronomy is really just one long sermon from Moses. I thought about just reading Deuteronomy this morning. Some, some of you would fall asleep. This sermon is a sermon given to the children of that faithless generation. Forty years in the wilderness, they're all grown up. So now, they're on the verge of entering the promised land. So as they're standing at that exact same point that their parents' failure occurred, Moses speaks to them the truth of God. And this sermon is Moses' last word to them. This is Moses' parting words to Israel. And I share all that context with you today because I want you to realize what a crucial moment this is in Israel's history. These are the last words of Moses, the great leader and lawgiver of the people of God. These are God's words to the next generation, a generation that is standing in the shadow of their parents' failure. They're at the exact same point that their parents were and failed. And the sermon is kind of like a blueprint, if you will, a blueprint, their call to faithfulness as they're preparing to go into the promised land and receive the blessings that God had promised to his people. So that's Deuteronomy in a nutshell. It's the last word of Moses, a word of this next generation, and a blueprint for how they are to live. So with all that in mind, let's just dive into Deuteronomy chapter 6. Here's what Moses says. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, so that you may may enjoy long life. Hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. So here we have Moses confronting the people with the truth of God. He's calling them to hear. He's calling them to take heart. He's calling them to obey God's word as they prepare themselves to enter into the promised land. And then Moses gets their attention. He says, listen to these things. And notice what it says next. This passage is known as the Shema. It's one of the most famously quoted texts in the entire Old Testament. In verse 4, here's what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Jewish people call this the Shema, because that's the first word here in the Hebrew, Shema, or hear. It's kind of fun to say, so turn to your neighbor and say Shema. Shema, right? You got your dad and you got Shema. (laughs) Sorry, I couldn't resist. This little section of Scripture here in verse 4 has been repeated by the Jewish people for generations. It's part of their morning and evening prayer. They begin their prayers by saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Every day, multiple times a day, they repeat that to remind them that this is who our God is. The Lord Yahweh is our God. Our God is one. He's not one among many gods. He's one, the one and only God. Every day they repeat that to remind them who God is. He's the one and only God. So Hear, O Israel, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And following that foundational bedrock statement, we then come to what Jesus himself describes as the greatest commandment. Look at verse 5. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. And that one commandment Jesus taught 
that it encapsulates all of the commandments. That summarizes God's will for our lives. So think about this. Moses' parting words, a generation on the verge of claiming the promises and the blessings of God. So this is who God is, and this is what God desires. Notice what Moses says next, verse 6. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your, what's the word? Say it with me. Children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. So the point that Moses is making here is this. These foundational truths of who God is and what He desires of us, they need to dominate your life. They need to be on your heart. And as they are, what's your responsibility with those truths? You are to impress them on your children. And some of your Bible translations probably say, teach them diligently. We are to diligently teach the next generation these foundational truths that are being imparted by God so that uh, to His people, who God is, right? He is one. How we are to live or to love Him with our whole being, those truths, as we grab a hold of them, they have a responsibility that comes with them. So that's our responsibility. Those truths are given to us. We are to teach them to the next generation. You're at this crucial moment in Israel's history, the history of God's people. God says, this is who I am. This is what I desire. And then He fixes their eyes on the next generation. Treasure these truths, but don't just keep them to yourself. Teach them to the next generation. So why is that our responsibility? Why does God place this responsibility upon His people? And I think the answer is simple. Because if we don't teach the next generation these truths, they're not going to figure them out on their own. We come back to the reality of the human heart that we talked about at the beginning of our time together. Our hearts are polluted. Our hearts are deceptive. And no truth is coming from inside of us. It's polluted. We need external truth. External truth, truth from outside of us. We need God's revelation. Because the fall of man, our hearts are sinful and broken and darkened. So we need the external revelation of God, the Word of God, the Spirit of God to come and teach us truth. And praise God in His grace that He has given that to us. But God says this revelation of truth needs to be passed on. Faithfully teach and disciple the next generation in truth, because if we don't, then they won't figure it out on their own. It's not going to just rise up inside of them from within their hearts. They won't figure it out on their own. And as history has shown us, if we don't teach them, then they'll lose it. They'll lose it. Think about it this way. Think about the story of King Josiah. If you're not a Bible person, let me just give you the Cliff Notes version of King Josiah. King Josiah was the ruler of the nation of, the na uh, the nation of Judah. There was the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. In the early days of his reign, there was an important discovery that was made. And that discovery really shapes the rest of of his years as king over Judah. And what happened was that Josiah had commissioned some men to go and clean up the temple. And because the temple had fallen into despair and neglect, Josiah commissioned some men to go and clean it up. And when they were cleaning and repairing the temple, they found something. They found a book. They found a scroll. And when they read it, they thought, this is really important. We need to bring this to the king. And then they read it to Josiah. And guess what book that happened to be? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. It had been lost. Josiah never heard those words from Deuteronomy. The people had forgotten about those words from the book of Deuteronomy. They'd forgotten because generations had failed to pass on the truth. And they neglected the word of God in their own lives, and they failed to teach it to the next generation. And as time passed, guess what happened? The truth was lost. And in the early days of Josiah's ministry, the spiritual state of the nation reflected that losing of the truth. So the temple was in such bad state because the people had embraced all kinds of wickedness and idolatry. They put some pagan idols in the temple, neglected the temple, went off to the hillside to worship pagan gods. The temple had fallen into neglect, into abuse. And the people had turned from the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He is the one and only God. But they turned from that. 
And they turn from believing that and from loving and worshiping God with all of their heart, with all of their soul, and with all of their strength. They lost all those things. So when the book was found, was brought into the presence of Josiah and read, do you know what he did? He tore his clothes. He tore his clothes because his heart was so broken and devastated because he realized the godlessness of his people, how far they were away from the truth. They were so far away from God's truth because God's word had been taught to them by, had not been taught to them by the previous generation. So church, this is our responsibility. It's our responsibility to teach the next generation the truth. It's our responsibility because they're not going to figure it out on their own. They need, to, they need people to, to lovingly communicate the truth to them. And if we don't do these things, then it too will be lost. And some of you have been a Christian for a while, and uh, perhaps you have already seen that happen. Uh, you see important truths of the life, life of the church. They're starting to fade away in churches all across America. And then you go over to the UK and to Europe, empty church buildings everywhere. And that's why God has called us to do this. So how are we to teach them? Well, look again at verse 7. Impress them on your children. and Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Moses is not calling these people to an occasional half-hearted, you know, if you're into that kind of thing, uh, maybe when you get around to it, you can just kind of squeeze it in. It's not that kind of approach to instructing the next generation. He's explaining that this instruction in the truth is confronting their hearts with the truth of God It needs to be taken seriously. Impress them on your children. Teach them diligently, some of your translations say. And it's interesting that that Hebrew word for diligently is a word that's often used to speak of repetition of action. It's a term that was commonly used to describe the sharpening of something or the engraving of an image upon something that needed action to get that image engraved on something. And that's the way this term was commonly used. But here it's being used to say that this is the way we're to teach the next generation. There is to be a deliberate, repeated action, sharpening them, engraving the truth upon them. And to further explain this type of deliberate, repeated instruction, it, it provides us a picture. Talk about them. Talk about what the commandments, the commands. When you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. So let's talk about that description a little bit. Some people might be tempted to look at that description and think to themselves, this is giving us kind of like a hodgepodge approach to teaching our kids. The temptation could be uh, to look at that and think, you know, if you're, if you're out and about and, and uh, you're doing something and the topic seems to come up, then you should have a conversation about your kids with some spiritual things. But that's not what this text is saying at all. The purpose of this list is to say that we ought to be totally integrated into the totality of a child's life. The picture is that we're, what we're seeing here is life at home, life outside a home, life when you go to bed, life when you get up. I mean, what other times are there? When you sleep, when you're awake, when you're at home, when you're not at home. In other words, our children need to be taught how God connects to all of life. It's not just a couple hours on Sunday morning when we go to church. That's not the idea. Our children need to see how God connects to all of life. But here's the thing. In order to teach them how God connects to all of life, we can't just have a shoot-from-the-hip approach to teaching. There needs to be a sharpened and diligent teaching where it needs to be intentional and formal instruction. In other words, thought out, planned out instruction. If you think about the things that our kids need to learn to understand all about life that's connected to God, what do they need to learn first? That there is a God. They need to be taught that there is one true living God. They need to learn that. Uh, they need to be taught that He is the Creator, right? Where did I come from? Well, God made us, right? Imago Dei. He's the Creator, sustainer of all things. They need to be taught that He is infinite, that He is triune, that He is sovereign, that He is holy, that He's loving and merciful and gracious, but also at the same time that God is righteous and just, and that in His righteousness and justice, He is filled with anger towards sin. They need to learn those things. And as we teach them about all that, that this is who God is, we also need to teach them that God desires stuff for us. 
what it looks like, what does it look like to love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength? And as we teach them that, we need to teach them that, that we failed to do that. Adam's sin in the garden, the ramifications that come out of that, we need to teach them that, guess what? Dad and mom are not perfect. That's not hard for us to persuade our son in, but we're sinners. And we need to teach them about their sin. We need to teach them that we have all rebelled against a loving God, and we have rebelled against loving God the way that he deserves to be loved. And what we do with that love, we should be giving to God, but instead we focus that love on ourselves, loving ourselves that way instead. We need to teach them about those truths, but as we teach them about that sinful reality, we don't just leave them there. Amen? We also need to teach them about the hope of God that is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God calls us to confess our sinfulness and to turn to faith in Jesus Christ. We need to teach them who Jesus is, God the Son who came and took upon Himself our humanity, lived for us, died for us, rose again on the third day so that our sin and the death that it earned for us would be done away with. We need to teach them those truths. We need to teach them what it looks like to live day in and day out by faith in Jesus. How to love God out of our whole person through faith in Him. But again, this needs to be happening intentionally. Intentional theology. Taught intentionally by their parents and their church about how God affects the totality of their life. Living for the one true living God. It's not child care. It's children's ministry. We're not entertaining. We're not, we're not entertaining. We're discipling up the next generation of the truths of God. It's the same with our youth ministry. It's not just child care for adolescents. It's ministry. It's discipleship. We should praise God for those people in our church that are doing that. Those who have committed to raising up the next generation. But just to clarify something, this, is, this call is upon all of us. All of us need to be willing to do our part. There's a temptation to think, I believe, like, I'm not going to serve in nursery. I'm not going to serve in children's ministry. I'm not going to serve in youth group because the parents can just take care of that. It's a temptation to think that way. This is God's word to his people. This is a great work of raising up the next generation. There's so much at stake. Also, to clarify something, the role of instructing the next generation is not the primary role of the children's church worker or the youth worker or the nursery worker the buck doesn't stop with them. The burden doesn't ultimately rest on them. The primary job of instructing the next generation falls upon the shoulders of moms, and especially who? Dads. That's really where the buck stops, on your shoulders. Dads, you're meant to be the primary spiritual teacher in your home. That's your little flock. As God addresses raising up the next generation, the primary person he focuses on is guess who? His dad. That's the primary role of fathers. Men are calling us to be pursuing God and growing and knowing His truth and then teaching those truths to our children. That's our job. That's our responsibility to be raising up our children, to be confronting their hearts with the truth. When you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up, we're to be filling our lives with conversations about God and His ways. There needs to be formal conversations about God going on at your house planned out, thought out conversations about God. Times of Bible reading, maybe family devotions, maybe it's going through a catechism with questions and answers about theology in the Bible. Maybe it's going through a book of the Bible with a teenager. Because if we just wait for these conversations to just happen, then guess what? They'll never, they'll happen every once in a while, but they won't be clear, formal instruction in truly understanding how the totality of life connects with God. So there needs to be a formal conversation going on in our homes about God, having these conversations with our kids, systematic, structured conversations about God and His ways happening in our homes. But there should also be a lot of informal conversations taking place about God. And, and moms and dads and grandparents can do this. Share with them the things that you're praying about, the things that, you're, that are on your heart. It's not hard, we just don't do it. Be ready to engage with them about spiritual topics 
But don't wait for them to bring it up. Be thinking about ways to bring it up. We just think about how beautiful today is. The beauty of nature. Hey, God made that. Wow. Help them see how all of life connects to God. And as we pursue this conversation, let's not make it a long lecture. Right? When I talk a lot, sometimes I'll say, thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Sometimes we can make we can make discipleship a long lecture. This is a call to authenticity with our kids because we should be pursuing God in the totality of our lives. We adults first have to have this Godward attitude towards all life that becomes the foundation for our conversations with our kids and with our grandkids as well. When you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and get up, we don't have to be perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but we have to allow God's truth to confront our hearts. Hearing the truth about who God is and what God has called us to do, and as we embrace and walk in those things, delighting in the gospel of our salvation and realize that our delight comes with a responsibility, a responsibility to disciple the next generation, and this is not going to happen accidentally. Left to our own devices, to their own devices, their hearts will run away from God. So their hearts need to be confronted with the truth systematically, formally, intentionally, repeatedly, authentically, confronted with the truth by mom, by dad, and by their church family. So that's our responsibility with our kids, Ribbon Grace, Brother Church. So may we be a church where we leverage our influences on coming generations, helping them to see life from God's point of view. Let's pray together. Well, Lord... I know I'm personally convicted uh, by this teaching today. And my guess is I'm not alone. And so, Lord, I just pray for your grace this morning. I know there's a lot of us that probably are like, man, I feel so woefully inadequate for this task. But, Lord, that's why we have the gospel. We can rest in your grace. We know that uh, you love us so much that you will accept us where you are, but you also love us so much that you don't want to keep us where we're at. You want to sanctify us, and you want to cause us to mature and grow in your son Jesus. So Lord, help us to not feel like we're alone today, and and I pray that you would remind us over and over that you've called us to this. This is our responsibility to the next generation. There is so much at stake. There's a crazy world that we live in. It's a crazy season, time to raise children and to disciple them. So Lord, may we be authentic in our teaching and cultivating our own discipleship and following you in faith and obedience. Help us to abide in you. You are the branches apart from you. We can do nothing. May we be a church, Lord, that spiritually invests into the next generation. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Our church's mission is to follow God, share his truth, and be examples of the love of Jesus to all. If you would like to know more about us, you can visit our website at www.rittmangrace.org or drop by anytime for one of our in-person Sunday morning worship services. Once again, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time for another episode of the Rittman Grace Podcast.